Wow, we sure do have a lot of Pokemon to play with now, don't we? I remember thinking sometime around Black and White that the Pokedex was getting a bit bloated and the Game Freak were running out of ideas for interesting design ideas. It somewhat coincided with another Cactus Pokemon and a Gear Pokemon that adds more onto itself every time, like a cut-priced Magnemite. And yet, here we are, still alive and kicking more than 9 years later with a Pokedex that is numbering dangerously close to 900 now that we've got another generation to play with. Pokemon Sword and Shield introduced an extra 81 Pokemon to the list, and while that may sound like a drop in the ocean at this stage, it's evident that a lot of work was put in to ensure that each one was creative and had at least a bit of competitive viability. Yes, even the Fat Squirrel. I'm always a little bit cautious whenever a new gen of Pokemon is slowly unveiling new additions to the roster since it's very easy to get caught up and obsess over each individual design and say that, oh, that's gonna be in my team, that's gonna be my favourite, look at him, he's adorable. I like to pay a little bit cooler and wait for more technical information that may sway you in one direction or another based on a slightly more informed decision. Yes, I do need technical information to enjoy this strange creamy dessert Pokemon. What about it? Despite understanding a lot about it, I've never been too into competitive Pokemon battling. I mean, I enjoy watching it and seeing new Pokemon shake up the metagame, but it's never really swayed my opinion on any new Pokemon to the point where a list of my favourites like this is more reflective of a tier list than anything else. Obviously I'm not going to do that since tier lists don't account for personal experience or trivial things like designs, but I'll try and keep things somewhat focused on how good I think each Pokemon is. This also carries forward through a whole evolutionary line, because for example Yampa is a wonderful Pokemon, but once it evolved into Boltund, I felt like it was a step back for me. You can't compare Daxons and Corgis, don't even try, I'll fight you! I did a pretty decent job of avoiding spoilers and leaks with this game. I know a lot of people like to know about every Pokemon in the roster before starting their adventures, but I love discovering Pokemon for the first time as I went through route by route. Obviously the first big decision you make is over the starters, and I loved Sobble from the first time I saw him, but I can't say that I'm as in love with any of the fully evolved starters. My favourite is still probably Inteleon, so I feel like I made the right decision, but it wouldn't rank too highly among other starters from previous generations. The good news is that I didn't have to worry about it since I picked up a Wooloo as soon as possible, and at least he didn't disappoint me. The great thing about avoiding spoilers is that I didn't even know that Wooloo evolved. Yes, I do want a fluffy sheep on my team because he is wholesome and wonderful, and I should probably care about other things like stats and natures and general team balance, and yet, I have other interests too. Wooloo makes for a great early discovery in Sword and Shield, and considering it evolves into Dubwool with its even stat distribution, it's a very smart choice for any adventure while also providing some welcome respite by being adorable in Pokemon Camp. What more could you possibly want? I mean, if this was last gen, we'd probably be able to ride around on them, and now that, that would be perfect. Maybe next time, Floof Boy. Logic dictates that after 8 generations of Pokemon games, the designs of new Pokemon would start to fall apart at the seams, and I suppose going to new regions is a very good idea since you gain access to new wildlife and foliage, but I can only stomach so many different variations of a yellow mouse. Or we could just like, draw googly eyes on something and call it a day. Do we want to talk about Applin, or do we just ignore it and hope that it goes away? Sword and Shield had some wild, far-reaching ideas for Pokemon designs, don't worry, we'll get to those eventually. But I don't think any Pokemon shocked me as much as this fucking apple thing. I think I fought a chef and he threw an apple in and I'd never seen it before, and obviously I fell in love instantly since I'm part of that camp that loves it when Game Freak sticks goofy eyes on objects and considers it a job well done. The fact that it evolves into other things and has life beyond being an apple is fucking bananas. It's a whole fruit salad of creativity. I genuinely laughed out loud when I saw that this thing was part dragon type, because of course it is. But Applin's evolutions justify this in a really satisfying way. Applin is like a worm that's burrowed its way into an apple, so it makes a lot of sense that the natural progression is for Applin to either burst out of the apple like a butterfly, or for it to be overcome by the apple and become the apple pie that it always wanted to be. In a world of serious Pokemon designs, I love that this exists and that I can use it to dump Dracometeors on much more serious looking Pokemon. 
None of these Pokemon are incredible. Applin doesn't even learn a new move until it evolves, but they're really fun to use and I love my Apple Sun with all of my heart. Please make more Pokemon like this. Just throw googly eyes on a loaf of bread next time, I dare you. It took Game Freak a while to figure out something to do with Pokemon that don't evolve. The act of evolving a Pokemon from one form to the next is a satisfying sign of growth that helps make the Pokemon stronger and a more potent threat, so not including that on some Pokemon means that those ones are at an automatic disadvantage. Obviously there's exceptions like legendary and mythical Pokemon that already have a massive step up, but I have noticed in recent times that Game Freak have started giving mono evolutions more to play with. Cramorant came out of the box already looking like the final evolution of something that hasn't got anything leading up to it, so it needs a gimmick or something tangible that you can latch onto that convinces you to pick one up. And hey, Game Freak did exactly that. They gave him a huge fucking mouth. For those of you who don't know, cormorants are seabirds that have their own form of fishing that people have used to help them catch fish for many years now, and helpfully, they're local to the British Isles, so there's some bonus biology points there. Cramorant is obviously a pun based on this bird that focuses on the fact that it's a very hungry Pokemon that likes to fill its mouth with fish and whatever else it can find while underwater. Statistically, he's nothing special with everything being well-rounded apart from a weak defense, but that's not why I and many others love this guy. I actually saw a gif on Twitter of what happens when Cramorant uses Dive or Surf and comes back with a goddamn Pikachu in its mouth, which it can spit out upon taking damage as a counter-attack. Seeing Pikachu struggle around in confusion is a beautiful sight and worth the price of admission alone. He must be fucking terrified. One of the single coolest things that Pokemon Sun and Moon did was introduce Alolan forms, and the best thing that Sword and Shield did was decide to keep this idea going with Galarian forms. Since Game Freak seem to be working hard to take Pokemon to new regions with unique ecosystems, it makes a lot of sense that Pokemon look a bit strange and come with new typings and abilities. Sword and Shield went one step further though, and allowed some of these Galarian forms to evolve into new Pokemon, which is potentially a dangerous step considering that it could tarnish a well-loved Pokemon, but the easiest rebuttal in the history of man would be Surfetched. Because damn, they made Farfetch sexy. Not just sexy, but actually, you know, Interesting? I mean, Farfetch'd is an alright Pokemon, but it doesn't do a lot for me apart from being comically obsessed with a stick of leak and being bang average for over 20 years. Sword and Shield offered a ray of hope though by making him a fighting type by giving him a massive leak stalk and a generally murderous look in his eyes, which is then carried forward so satisfyingly when he evolves into Surfetch'd and gets a giant sword made of leak. It's such a dramatic glow up that gives this line of Pokemon way more viability than before and gives one of the black sheep of the franchise Fuck me eyes that I didn't really need to see, but I'm glad to see all the same. Stop doing this to me, Pokemon. For a while now, I've thought that making new Pokemon is actually a lot easier than a lot of people think. This franchise has been going on for ages now, and if you want genuinely new ideas for Pokemon, it might be a good idea to not lean into the usual normal flying types or grass, poison, mushroom looking things, since all you need to do is look at which type combinations haven't been tapped into and think of a design that gets the most out of that. Personally, I want a normal ghost type, since it'll probably be some kind of sheet ghost and you could give it levitate as an ability, and it'd be immune to four types, and it'd be amazing! We didn't get that in Sword and Shield, but we did get Toxtricity and all of his punk rock goodness, so that'll do for now. There's some logic to how Toxtricity came about. If you have a type combination of Electric and Poison, then you can lean into one aesthetically and borrow ideas from the other. So you can say Poison has a certain vibe to it, and if anything, Black and White 2 basically said that this is kind of like a rock music kind of thing. And Electricity, you add some of that to it and you end up with a musician, a guitarist Pokemon. And that sounds fucking wild. Not that you'd have any idea that this was coming if you picked up a Toxel from the daycare like I did. This cute purple baby clearly can't be fucked, and I respect that, but it doesn't learn a lot of moves or have particularly engaging stats, so if it could perhaps transform into a base guitar Pokemon that chugs putrid water just to feel something in life, I'd like that quite a lot. 
Toxtricity, with a name that could easily be the name of a punk rock band from the 90s, is a really fun marriage between two strong offensive types with a ton of coverage, and there aren't many type combinations out there that flat out resist both electric and poison. Coupled with an ability that means that sound based moves like Boom Burst and Overdrive do more damage, and Toxtricity hits like a train and looks pretty good doing so. Now just give me my Sheik Ghost normal ghost type, and Pokemon is perfect once again. Looking through the Galarian forms, Game Freak had a lot of fun with some of these designs. Mr. Mime is a tap dancer, now Rapidash is a wonderful unicorn, and Meowth is a grizzled sailor with a massive beard for some fucking reason. Maybe I made that beard video a little too soon. They're all a bit silly, and smack of Game Freak having the opportunity to make weird side grades to existing designs just for the hell of it. I for one welcome this newfound creative freedom and pray that this continues on for many generations to come. It'll be great because we'll go to places like China and Australia and get regional forms that look like Overwatch skins and I personally can't wait to see Gerda carry a cricket bat around. It's already given us wheezing with facial hair made of toxic gases that wears a long stovepipe hat that pumps out clean air. Anything else is a bonus at this stage. And that's the power of updating old designs because I never really liked original Kanto wheezing. I was always more of a muck man myself, and since he got a refresh look in the last gen, it's only natural that Weezing got a much needed facelift in this generation. The surprising thing is how much better Weezing is now, since he's picked up Fairy as a secondary type, and even though this actually makes Weezing weak to more types, it comes with the benefit of greater competitive viability, since now he can tackle Dragon Pokemon and make other Pokemon so much better thanks to his new ability, Neutralizing Gas. Any ability that passively disables other abilities is automatically a game changer, and in double battles, this has the potential to give Pokemon like Slaking and Regigigas a new lease on life. And Galarian Weezing manages this all while cleaning the air and saving the environment. You were too late to save Corsola though. Their blood is on your hands. Pseudo legendaries are some awesome fucking Pokemon. I wasn't so crazy about Como O from last gen, but apart from that, they've always been really strong Pokemon with interesting designs and uniquely powerful type combinations, and it's so easy to steamroll most of the game with them. Not knowing much about Sword and Shield before playing them meant that I had no real clue what little baby Pokemon to look out for that might one day turn into some kind of unstoppable powerhouse, but apparently it was this cute little fella called Dreepy, who the Pokedex says is so weak that even a small child could overpower it. I know you're supposed to be awesome eventually, but all I want to do is protect you. And that's going to be hard to do when Dragapult is actively launching Dreepies as missiles, which is very confusing since the middle form just gets a Dreepy on its head out of nowhere when it evolves, and Dragapult gets another one, and I'm reminded of Kangaskhan hatching out of an egg and already having a baby in its pouch, and I just can't sometimes. I picked up Dragapult really late in my first playthrough, which I imagine was the case of most players who got one, but with its massive speed and potent attack stats, it didn't take long before it was pulling its weight in a big way. It's got the same typing as Giratina, and comes with three very useful abilities to suit very different movesets, which is handy because it can seemingly learn an absolute boatload of moves. Dragapult might look a bit flimsy, but it's got plenty of weapons in its arsenal to leave a severe dent in any team, and probably a severe dent in friendly Dreepies. Please don't fire babies as supersonic missiles. The Dragon Ghost typing is actually the perfect double-edged sword, since yes, it can very easily take on most of the roster in any Pokemon game, and yet it's very weak to itself, since both Dragon and Ghost are super effective against the very same type. So, if you put that on a Dragapult, where it's all about speed and attack and hitting something very fast and hard and running away, putting two of them next to each other and in front of each other? It's like a, an old western shoot-off, or a duel. It's all gonna be over very, very quickly. Sword and Shield really do benefit from a bit of research into UK fauna and flora, or even just local customs. I mean, we have squirrels and corgis and dark knights and Gene Simmonses, even though he's definitely not British. And I couldn't tell you how many times I've popped down to the shops for some milk, only for a disproportionate bird dragon to leap out of the bushes and savagely attack me. 
It's a very common occurrence in this country, and even though it claims thousands of lives a year, the government prefers to squash stories about it because it was actually their funding that created the disproportionate bird dragon in the first place. Anyway, so Pokemon. I love these new fossil Pokemon so much, and I fully respect how much of a risk they must have been. You take some fossils and they have to be combined with others in order to resurrect a Pokemon, and through some horrifying display of science going way too far, you can create up to four different Pokemon with a Frankenstein's monster approach to body parts haphazardly stapled together, and the end result is four of the funniest Pokemon we've ever had. It's just so much fun seeing how these Pokemon come together and the type combinations you get from them and hilarious Pokedex entries that talk about how uncomfortable they feel and secretly wish for death. Even beyond the memes, some of these are actually great Pokemon, since Dracovish is a bulky monster with a great typing, and access to a killer signature move that does a fuck ton of damage, and this horrifying thing actually has some use. Apparently all of these fossils are based off of the fact that old paleontologists in this country used to mix up bones to accidentally create new dinosaurs, and this made it into a Pokemon game and I couldn't be happier. Arctazolt reminds me of that one kid from Wind Waker and he's my special child. Don't hate him. He can't help being who he is. I saw Alolan and Galarian forms as a second opportunity for neglected Pokemon to get more than just a cult following. Regional forms helped give Raichu some much needed limelight, and Exeggutal went from being some kind of interesting coconut tree to being a long necked monstrosity that for some reason is a dragon type. It's much the same in Sword and Shield, since we've got Galarian forms of Stunfisk and Corsola, and an entire evolutionary line for Zigzagoon, and yet despite this we've got a Galarian form for Darumaka and Darmanitan, a pair of Pokemon who weren't exactly struggling for popularity or competitive usage, or even interesting concepts. And now we've got a Pokemon with crazy stats that can become a Fire Ice type once it's lost enough HP. So that's a cool thing that's just happened. A Fire Ice type is one of those really fun combinations, much like Fire Grass would be when Game Freak get around to it, that would properly get those creative juices flowing as to what kind of Pokemon that would look like. It turns out it's some kind of terrifying flaming snowman whose stats have been shifted so that everything is in attack and speed, so that no one in the Galar region is safe anymore. Darmanitan was always a potent attacking threat under normal circumstances, with the Zen mode acting as an alternate form where the focus is on a special attack and general bulkiness. His Galarian form is like, hey man, I'ma just be even scarier for no real reason, shape most of the early meta game. I haven't been this scared of a snowman in a long time. I'll be real with you, there's always a real reluctance to put legendary Pokemon at the top of a list like this. It feels like the cheap way out, since you're dealing with Pokemon that are designed to be in the top 5% of strongest Pokemon in the whole roster, so it often feels like the obvious boring choice to say that Zacian or Zamazenta are your favourite Pokemon since Sword and Shield, since they're kinda designed in that way. Legendary Pokemon have been the box mascot since Gen 2, so it's evidently what Game Freak wants you to think. They want you to see them on the cover of the game and think, yeah, that one's gonna be my favourite Pokemon. And when Zacian is as incredible a Pokemon as it is, there's very good reason to think that. So Sword Wolf, or a wolf that carries a sword in its mouth, which already is a wonderful thing that I'll get back to later, but Zacian in crown sword form is a terrifying prospect. Without the magic sword, Zacian is already a pretty powerful Pokemon, if just a bit more balanced this way, with a slight sway towards attack and speed. Given the rusted sword, and Zacian explodes into life, becoming this unstoppable offensive monster, and thanks to gaining a secondary type to make him fairy steel now, there's not a lot that Zacian can't deal with. More importantly, he can take down dragons and fairies, and most of what lies in between with consummate ease. Plus, his ability gives him an automatic attack boost when coming into battle, like a reverse intimidate. Throw a sword to dance on top of that, and we might as well not have any other Pokemon. This is Rebel Luigi, and the added little personal detail that I love about Zacian is of course the wolf with a sword idea, and naturally when this Pokemon was revealed, a lot of people said that Zacian does indeed look like Sif the Grey Wolf from Dark Souls fame. It obviously isn't, there's other things going on there, but in my head, I like playing as one of gaming's greatest puppins, or at least pretending to. It does make nicknaming it a bit too brain dead though.